And uh, tonight it is my privilege, uh, in his absence, to introduce another very special guest to you. And this person has spent the last 55 years ministering to families and children. And along the way, he starred in several major movies, a couple of commercials that I know about. And yet, in spite of his worldwide fame and acclaim, he has graciously agreed to be here tonight for this Wednesday night Bible study. So please, if you would, give a warm and rowdy Calvary Chapel welcome to Mr. Potato Head. Now, you may notice he's wearing a Marlins uh, outfit. I don't know how well you can see some of those things there. But uh, for today, for today only, we'll call him Pastor Potato Head, if you don't mind, uh, because he's going to teach us a few things about the Bible. Now, some of you might say, what in the world does Pastor Potato Head have to do with 1 Corinthians 12? Well, if you'll look with me at 1 Corinthians 12, that's where we'll be studying tonight. And it is the 12th through the 27th verse. And if you look there, you'll see in this section of Scripture that Paul, he preaches and he teaches to us that the church is a body and that that body is made up of many different parts, many body parts. And that's the title of tonight's teaching. Now, of course, Paul didn't use Mr. Potato Head as the exact analogy, but he used the human body, but I wanted, in a way, to just bring this special spud here who has meant so much to me as an additional visual aid so that you might maybe remember Paul's points and really take them home with you. See, if we don't learn and we don't live what the Bible has to say about body parts, we are always going to be frustrated with ourselves. We are going to be usually frustrated with others. We'll be in constant competition with others in the body of Christ. We will have envy, we'll have strife, and we will be very critical and can become very cynical if we don't understand what God had to say about body parts. So if, if you don't know tonight what body part you are, maybe tonight by the end you will have a better understanding of these things. And you might, if you don't pay attention to these things, miss out on the very purpose and meaning of your life. And so if you'll think of it this way, how popular do you think Mr. Potato Head would have been if there were no body parts included with him? Just a potato, you know, here son, have fun, you know, play a little hot potato or whatever. Well, no, you see, there are parts that are in there, and, and maybe if it just had one part, let's say it just had one part and it was a clone of that same part, you know, just an eye and a bunch of different eyes that look exactly the same. Well, again, I don't think it would have survived the last 55 years as one of the most popular toys in America and around the world if it were just a bunch of eyes or ears or something like that. No, the whole point of Mr. Potato Head, of course, is... The joy of the toy there is finding the fit and the different things that go in there and the diversity of the parts that come with that unity of putting them all in the potato. Now, every part, of course, matters and every part has its place. And so in the same way, God has divinely designed a body of believers. Now, some of you are saying, well, I know what part I am. I'm the potato. I'm a pew potato. You know, I'm a, a couch potato in the body of Christ or something like that. You know, I even kind of shaped that way or whatever. Well, no, again, th the body of Christ, it's an analogy for us to understand. And it's not meant for us to be a bunch of couch potatoes. It's certainly made up of many different parts, though, in the, bo in the body of Christ, many different body parts. And on a global level, of course, on a worldwide level, the body of Christ is made up of all believers, all Christians. And then on the local level, well, of course, God has some smaller bodies in the sense that there's a local church, there's a faith family that you would find yourself in. And so like here at Calvary Chapel, Kendall, you can find that little part of the body of Christ in a way, a little spud, if you will. And so if you consider yourself a Christian here tonight, just know that you're a part of the body of Christ, not only on a worldwide level, but of course on the local level. And when you come to the body of Christ, this is one of the things that you'll learn, is that you have a unique part to play. Some people don't really recognize that right away, but you have a hole to fill. You think about it this way, the potato has a little spot there just waiting for you, you know, and you say, well, good, it looks like me. Whoops, that's what would happen to me if I tried to do that. There. 
Much better, right? Oops, upside down. Okay. Now, thinking about that, the church gets built in a certain way. What is it? Well, we're going to see it in tonight's teaching, which is that if the church came in a box, and of course it doesn't, but if it did come in a box, it would have those words on it that every parent fears. Some assembly required, right? As a parent, you go, oh, Christmas is coming. No, I don't like that when it's written on a box. And here's the thing. Fortunately, we have instructions, of course. You have them in your hand, in your lap. That's the Bible. And we're looking tonight at 1 Corinthians 12 on how the church gets built. The Bible makes it clear that it's a work of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means that God is the one putting the whole potato together and putting all the parts into the right spots. And with that, of course, he is giving gifts to individuals in that so that they fit right into their spot. And so you might say that he's the originator of divine design. Some of you maybe watch that on HGTV and you think, oh, Candace Olsen, right? No, the original divine designer was and is God. And so God gives particular gifts to particular people for different reasons and places those body parts together so that they can work in a way that they not only bless each other, but of course, bring glory to God. And so if you think about Jesus for just a moment, I like to always make sure that he's the focal point because he should be. And, and as he walked this earth, of course, he had a physical body, right? He had hands, he had feet, he had a nose, he had a mouth, all that stuff. And he used his body to do the will of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you think about it, that's really what Jesus was doing here. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God, he was doing the will of God the Father. And there you see him using his body for that purpose. But then, of course, he physically ascended from the earth after his resurrection and yet he left behind a body. Not a physical body, but a distributed body, a, a spiritual body in the sense that now everybody who is one of his, well, they can become part of the body of Christ in the sense that he said, man, you're going to do even greater works than I did when I was here. How can that possibly be? Because everybody now is going to have the ability to do the will of God through the power of the Spirit. And there will be Christians all over the world. So he told his followers, you're now my body. You're now my hands and my feet and my mouth and maybe even my nose in some way. And so here it is in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul picking up on that analogy, the body of Christ, like the human body, one body, many parts, or for the purposes tonight, one potato, many parts. And unlike Mr. Potato Head, here's the thing that's so important. The body parts are not plastic. They're people. That's really what's going on there. You are one of the body parts in God's divine design, and you've been given gifts, as we're going to be discussing even more in the surrounding teachings in this section, to fit your function in the body of Christ. So pick up the uh, narrative here with me in verse 12 of chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. It says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink into one Spirit, for in fact the body is not one member but many. Now, right away I want to just take some time in tonight's teaching to, to give you a little bit of a preview of where we're going. We're going to have four main points, four main sections, and I want to start with a summary of Paul's point in verses 12 through 14, and it's uh, something you'll see up here on the screen, which is without a head, you're dead. Okay, that's the first part that we have to start with. Without a head, you're dead. Now again, thinking of it in terms of Mr. Potato over here, no other body part can, can substitute really for a lack of a head. If you don't have the head, you're dead. You can lose all kinds of body parts. You can have things fall off. You know, I used to know a guy on his car, he had a bumper sticker that said, please honk if something falls off. And sometimes I feel like I should put that on my body these days. You know, please honk if something falls off, I might need it. You know, but as we fall apart, you can say, oh, I can do without some things, but without my head, I'm dead. And all throughout this passage, you're going to see, and all throughout this section, he keeps emphasizing the fact that without the connection to the head, without the... Uh, Spirit of God as the central focus in your life, well, you're dead. You're not going to make it. And all throughout this passage, Paul makes that point over and over again so we don't miss the message. He keeps saying, hey, there's only one way into the body of Christ, one spirit, one Lord, one body, one head. 
And the only way to be part of the body of Christ, either globally or locally, is to be connected to Christ, to have him as your head. And you see that sometimes Christians f- struggle maybe to find their specific fit in a local church body or whatever else or say, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Am I this? Am I that? What am I supposed to be doing? But here's the thing. I think it may take some trial and error and some time in a person's life to find those things. But this is the biggest issue. It's really, if you're connected to the head, you're going to find your fit. You're going to find your fit because it's the head that actually puts you in the proper place and think about this i can make your search at least easier by eliminating one body part that i know you're not you are not the head Uh, you can know that right away and just think in your life hey i am not the head now some of you right away are saying am i the other end no think about this but you are not the head jesus is the head and the head leads and directs the body again no head you're dead And Ephesians 4.15 makes it very clear for us as I quote it for you. It says, Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So, again, thinking of that, it's so important for us to know, hey, is he your head? Because if you are thinking, maybe I want to be the head of my life, or I want to do this, well, you're going to find yourself that you're never going to find your fit in life. Life's going to be very frustrating to you, and you're never going to really figure things out until you figure that first thing out which is, man, without a head, I'm dead. I need a head. And there's only one head that makes sense in life, and that is Christ. Now, this is a bit of trivia, but I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but if, if you had bought a Mr. Potato Head in 1952 when it first came out, you know what came in the box? A bunch of stuff, but no potato, no head. You actually, back then, provided your own potato, right? You would just do that, and you'd poke holes wherever you wanted to and all this stuff but I suppose that got kind of messy in a way and it got to be one of those things that as people provided their own head it didn't work out very well and so pretty quickly they figured out no we'll provide the head and we'll put let them put the parts wherever they want to put them now a lot of times again people make that mistake in a church of thinking that the pastor is the head right or one of the pastors or all of the pastors or something like that listen No particular person here is the head. And you say, oh no, it's the headless church. No, not at all. (laughs) But Pastor Pedro would tell you if he were here, I am not the head. Jesus Christ is the head. And see, the minute a church starts thinking that the people are heads, oh, it starts heading in the wrong direction. And it's heading toward dead, my friends. So without a head, you're dead. Just remember that. In the Spirit of God, in the Word of God, what you see here is that He gives life to the body and He is that common element through all of us. He's the one that directs and controls the gifts in the church. He is the head. And to be a part of the body of Christ, again, which is the best thing you could possibly do with your life, you need to have that relationship with the head. And once you have your head on straight, well, a lot more in life starts to straighten out with it and God will put you in that right spot. Now, that brings us to the second point, which is that everybody is somebody. If you're taking notes, you can just write that down simply. Everybody is somebody. In other words, you matter. Now that, again, could be misunderstood in some ways because we have a society that wants to make you the center of the universe, you know, and that sort of thing. But some people don't even understand this, that you do matter. There is a purpose and a meaning in your life. If you aren't here, there is a hole. Now again, I'm taking it here and you can see, hey, if that part is missing, there's a hole there. And the truth is, in the body of Christ, unfortunately, there are a lot of missing spots where it's just like, oh, I don't want to do that, or I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, and all the rest. And you start looking at that, and you realize, listen, everybody is somebody. And God has gifted you uniquely. And I think a lot of times people look at people who are already in their place, and they say, man, look at that. I can't do that, so I guess there isn't a place for me. But that's the whole thing is that you look for the places where there are holes and you say, man, I think that's my spot. And you start to realize that if if God gives gifts, well, he gives them for the blessing of the whole body. Now, some of you would say, hey, if God gave me as a gift to the body of Christ, I hope he kept the receipt because I'd like to return it or people will want to return it. No, here's the thing. If a person thinks, hey, I'm a nobody, they're really missing something so important because a lot of times they say I'm a nobody because I'm not like that somebody over there. I know of a person who I really admire and I wish there were 
two of them and none of me. You know, ever had that thought that's kind of like, if only there were just, I could clone that person and live their life form. I really like their life a whole lot more than I like mine. But you see in there that the whole reason you're not like everybody else is that there's a specific spot for you that only you can fill. And so you look at those things, and as you start to say sometimes, I'm so different, I feel so outcast, I, I'm not like everybody else. Exactly. You're not like everybody else. And everybody is somebody in the body of Christ. You see it there in verse 15. It says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. Well, is it therefore not a part of the body? If an ear should say, verse 16, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Now again, if body parts could talk, you know, body language, I suppose. It's kind of easy to imagine a foot saying there, to the hands, oh man, you guys got it made. You know, or an ear deciding, I'm very inferior to the eye. I mean, think about it. Feet don't get much respect, right? I mean, this is kind of the most I'm going to show you of my feet right here. They're covered with shoes and a sock on top of that just to make sure. But I don't really show my feet off a lot. My wife knows what they look like and she can tell you, keep them covered. Now, <laughs> here's the thing. I didn't ask for my wife's feet in marriage, right? You don't say, oh, I, didn't, I go to her father and say, could I have your daughter's foot in marriage? And you go, no, it's hand in marriage, right? Now, I got the foot too. It's nice, nice in mine, that's for sure. But, you know, you think about those things. Ears, they don't get much positive feedback, do they? Not as much as eyes. You know, uh, you can hear an ear. I guess you could hear an ear complaining. Why does the eye get to be the window of the soul? I mean, you know. Uh, who picked that? No love song that I've ever heard has been written that said, I was captivated as I looked deeply into her ears. <laughs> See, salespeople, I mean, if you're one, you've probably never told your sales force, make sure that you maintain ear contact with the customer. That's how you're going to make that sale. No, see, and yet you think about it, ears are very, very important, aren't they? They're not only important to our hearing, you're hearing me right now, but this is the thing, it also gives us balance. If I were to have an ear infection right now, I wouldn't be able to stand straight. I wouldn't even be able to be up here, I would fall down. And maybe you have encountered the situation where if you can't hear right, it can actually cause impediments in other areas. It can cause somebody to struggle with speech and make that more difficult. So other parts of the body can struggle because... One part is not there. And so there's no such thing as a useless part of the human body or of the Mr. Potato Head body here or of the church body. Because who would willingly give up any part of their body? Now, again, some of you say, well, what about liposuction or something like that? I, I, okay, okay, don't push the analogy. But here's the point. A hand or a foot, would you give one up? See, God gave us every part playing a part and sickness and injury and all those things can very quickly get us appreciating parts that we never even knew we had you ever had one of those where the doctor comes back and says this is the problem with your and you go what is that you know well you need it and it's having problems right now and you wow i didn't even know i had it and suddenly you can become a great expert on some body part that was previously pretty obscure and so just the other day, I read an article, maybe you saw it, that talked about the fact that scientists have finally discovered what the appendix is for. Like all this time, when I was growing up, I even remember people telling me, evolution is true. There isn't a divine design because obviously if God made the body, he made a mistake here because he put something in us that all it does is rupture, but it never does anything. And science have no idea what it does. There's no intelligent design and all that sort of thing, a leftover from uh, uh, you know, our millions and billions of years and all that kind of stuff. But what do you know? Modern science all of a sudden figured out, oh, wait, it helps fight infection. And it does have a very useful purpose, even for us today. And so God prepares unique body parts. And God made no two fingerprints alike and no two people alike. 
And so God is a God of infinite variety, and I actually like that about him, and he wants us to be of infinite variety. Now, the church is told to have unity, but never uniformity. See, uniformity is when everything's exactly the same, and that's how we get along. Oh, I like you because you're like me. That's good. You know, I can get along with me, and if I can find more people like me, this will be wonderful. No, this is the thing. We can all be extremely different and still be more like Jesus. See, it's great. It's not the point for you to be more like me. It's for you to be more like you in Christ. That's the real point, not to be more like another person. And so you see in these things, God has variety. And the common thread, as you saw it there in verse 12, 13, and 14, was in all that diversity, the unity of the one spirit. And so he's the head. We're the body parts. And you may know the motto of the United States. I think it's a good one. E pluribus unum. You know what that means on the back of the dollar? It means out of many, one. And all that's saying is, hey, there's a great strength, and one of the great strengths of this country has been not that it had uniformity, but that it had unity in diversity. And if you have diversity without unity, well, you have all kinds of problems. If you have uniformity well you have all kinds of problems too because then all you want to do is eliminate anything that's any different but you see that what god is all about in the body of christ is a unity in diversity that's what he did in our physical body all parts are not the same but they all are necessary even to each other and so have you ever felt redundant in the body and said well i must be one of those parts that really isn't that important whatever a uvula is i must be that you know or something like that or uh, uh, inferior all the good parts are taken ever thought that you know oh man the only thing left is a big toe and i don't want to be a big toe on the body of christ you know but if you've ever broke a big toe or anyone ever lost one you know it's pretty hard to run pretty hard to stand in fact in the bible days what they would do to kings when they captured them is they would remove their thumbs and their big toes. And they knew that person would never be a fighter and he'd never be a runner after they had done those things to them. And so you think about it, again, this portion of scripture, he's saying, I'm not a hand. I must not be part of the body. I don't have a reason for being here. And the ear's saying, well, I'm not an eye, so I guess I don't fit in on the face. But again, remember, everybody is somebody in the body. And in life, we can so quickly pick parts that we say, man, I really wanted to be that I wish I were over there, but trying to be somebody that God has not made you to be or trying to make somebody else something that God has not made them to be is one of those ways to really get frustrated and feel like a failure and really get hurt. Let me give you a visual example in your own life. We're just going to do a little exercise here, which is with your elbow and your knee. Now, don't kick the person next to you. Please don't hit the person next to you. We want to get along in the body of Christ. But think about this. Your elbow, its normal range of motion is kind of forward, right? I mean, you can rotate it around and everything, but some of you are double-jointed and you're ready to argue with me and all the rest of that. But hey, the bottom line is your elbow goes forward, right? It doesn't go backwards, not very far. And then you also have your knee, which its primary way of going is backwards. Again, you can do different things with it, but it doesn't bend this way. At least you don't want it to. You would walk fairly interesting if it did. And so you think about these two things. What if these two parts of your body were to not appreciate the differences between each other, but to kind of get into a conversation with one of those things where the elbow looks down and says, man, that's bending backwards looks fun. I'm going to try that, you know, and uh, okay, try it now. Don't try it too hard because I don't want to visit the hospital with you guys. But you go, oh man, it's not easy, is it? All of a sudden you go, ooh, that's as far as that goes. And the knee might look on and say, I don't know what your problem is, man. This is easy. This is natural. This comes really easy. But they could get back into a competition, back and forth. Of why do you, why do you, blah, 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 all the rest. And there's such a wonderful thing when you come to realize in a marriage, in a family, in a church family, in the world, that you know what? There's ranges of motion and emotion and all kinds of things that may come to you very naturally and to others. Uh, I don't know. It's not quite the same. And so you see, I, of course, I'm not talking about areas of sin and all the rest of that. Please don't get the wrong idea. But I'm getting the point that, hey, body parts, God made them with certain reasons and certain ways of working. And so you see in those things that if you picture the body parts, well, they could get puffed up in pride about their own differences. And pride kind of comes in two different flavors. I like to 
picture it like a pendulum, okay? If you're looking up here, way over here on this side, and no offense to this side of the room, but let's say this is the self-condemnation side. You know, the one that says, I stink, I'm terrible, I never amount to anything. Okay, that's you guys. Now, this is the nice biblically balanced people here in the middle, okay? And then over here we have the people who are not the self condemnation but the self-exaltation folks who say yeah you're right you do stink but I am wonderful over here and everything is great on this side of the room now you think about that pendulum here's the thing self-condemnation says this you matter but I don't that's self-condemnation you matter but I don't self-exaltation says you know what I matter but you don't it's the exact opposite Self-condemnation says this, I'm a nobody. Self-exaltation says, I am everybody. I am everything. And so verse 15 through 19, if you look at it with me, you'll see that it addressed the body parts that would have one side of pride. Which is it? It's that side of pride that's self-condemning. Self-condemning. I don't belong to the body. I'm so different. Well, again, that may not sound like pride initially, but it really is. It's just the other side of pride. When we remember everybody is somebody, we can come to the conclusion, you know what? I matter, you matter, we all matter. We have a unique place and purpose in the God-given roles that God has provided for us. And that is going to keep us from self-condemnation, which is a horrible place to live. But then you also see in verse 20 through 22, Paul turns to the other side of pride, the self-exaltation side. And he says to them, hey, nobody is everybody. Nobody is everybody. Nobody, no matter how much and how important they may seem in and of themselves. Well, there's no such thing as a one-man show, especially not in the body of Christ. There is no body part that is everything. And as you can see even from the slide, I love the way he did it because he took away the head in this one. It's kind of like if you're a part that just thinks, I am everything. Well, somehow you lose sight of Christ and all that pretty quickly. And so this is what you see in verse 19. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have a need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, the key to understanding this section, which was all about self-exalted body parts, is that little thing that says, I have no need of you. If you ever find yourself dismissing anybody in the world with that, I have no need of you, well, you can know that you're falling into that side of pride that says, Man, I, I don't, I'm everything. I am everything. I have no need of you. In other words, I'm the only par part that really matters. And humility is realizing in that balance that everybody is somebody, but nobody is everybody. And so nobody can cover every base or fulfill every role in life. And maybe you've seen along the way one of those kind of street musicians who have the one-man band, you ever seen one of those? You know, they have the harmonica and they've got a guitar and they're playing the banjo with one foot and they've got the drums back here and the cymbals and everything else. And you go, wow. Now, I don't know, you may remember seeing that, but I doubt if you remember hearing it, like saying, wow, it was such beautiful music. No, it isn't. It's not music. It's a novelty. You go, wow, how does he do all that? But it's really not going to provide what an orchestra could do with that same set of instruments, with people playing their proper spot, with people doing the things that they're really made to do. Because nobody's everybody. And certain body parts can be very, very noticeable, very, very visible, but that doesn't make them the most vital, really. In fact, some of the most vital organs that you have in your life are easily overlooked and underappreciated. I don't know if you would part with your pancreas. I don't even know if you know what your pancreas does. Some people do, some people don't, you know, but it's one of those words. I like the word pancreas, you know. Would you be willing to live without your liver? You say, ooh, I don't know if I want to try that, you know, but yet we don't shake livers, right? We shake hands. We, we have body parts that maybe are a little more visible, but again, you could quicker live without your hand than you could without your liver. And some people have a tendency to compare their weaknesses with the strengths of other and they feel very condemned because they'll look at their weakness and they'll look at your strength and they'll go, man, I don't have that. I'm a nobody. 
But then a lot of other people make the other mistake where they'll compare their strengths to your weaknesses and they start feeling puffed up in those things. But I think what we're really called to do in a biblical balance is to bring our strengths and our weaknesses to Christ and say, Lord, use me as you would will. And those weaknesses, I'm going to have to depend on you and I might even have to humbly depend on some others in my life. And hey, Lord, those strengths, let me never think that they're anything other than a gift of yours meant to help the weak in some other areas. And so you see that inter interdependence. That's what it's all about. Bringing your strengths and your weaknesses to Christ because nobody is everybody. And then you see in verse 22, he says, no, no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the parts which lacked it. Now, if any of you were at the baptism the other day, um, one of the things you'll notice any time I go to the, the baptisms, I tend to wear clothes about like I'm wearing now. Uh, and a lot of you go, you're at the beach, Scott. I don't know if you notice, but most people don't wear long clothes and long sleeves and all the rest at the beach. But uh, if you were there, I kind of compared two uh, bodies there. And there was a, a guy there who's got one of those beach bodies. You know what I'm talking about? Just uh, buff and, and, and very... Uh, tan and all the rest and, and uh, I said you know you have a beach body I have a bleach body okay <laughs> so it deserves a little greater modesty uh, okay I don't want to blind anybody here and uh, also the doctor has told me you stay out of the sun my friends so uh, you know as I think about those things again there's different things where you go oh modesty presentable parts all the rest of this sort of thing remember unseen Anybody here ever seen their spleen? And uh, hopefully you haven't, but you know, you don't want to see it. But it's unseen, but it's vital. You know, and you think about these weaker parts and things that sometimes are vital organs. Man, they're surrounded by a cage of bones so that things don't happen to them because God knows, hey, some of those unseen parts are very, very crucial to life. And just because you're not visible in the body of Christ doesn't mean you're not valuable in the body of Christ. Sometimes the more valuable members, the more important, the more crucial people sometimes are quite invisible in what they do or wouldn't have their name known. And that's exactly what he's saying here. But this is what's great is that God has x-ray vision. He sees internal organs, external organs. He sees it all. There is nothing hidden from God. And so, you know, sometimes there will be people who will say, man, I don't even know if I matter around here. I could disappear and nobody would even know. Oh, well, God would know. And also, as it comes back to it, there'd be a hole if you're not here. And so you see those things. It brings us to the conclusion of the lesson, I believe. Without a head, we're dead. Remember that? Without Christ, well, hey, we can't call ourselves Christians or certainly not the body of Christ. But I think far too many Christians stop right there. You know, they kind of have the, hey, it's me and Jesus. We just get along great. You know what? Jesus is very lovable. I don't know if you've noticed, but he is very easy to get along with, I've found. And so, so many people do have that. Hey, it's just me connected right to the head. You know, that would be a strange body, wouldn't it? In which everything was directly connected to the head. And so you see, so many people have that kind of understanding, but God wants us to have a deeper understanding, which is, oh, we need him. We have a great dependence on him. But he has constructed it in, in the way that we have a great interdependence with each other. And there is a part of the body of Christ that in a way I believe you can only learn from other people. There are things that you can only have with that connection with the body of Christ. Not that Jesus is not all in all because he is, but he's also in all of his followers. And there's parts that you look at and you say, man, I have learned so much from the different body parts from the interaction with them and I think God even sometimes puts some body parts in our lives that are their very role and reason in our life is to mold and to shape us to be more like Christ you go I I think we could chop that body part right off and it would be no problem at all and you say well that may be the very part that God is using that you would be able to fill your part and learn to love in that way because everyone's someone and no one is everyone 
And then the final thing, apart cannot be apart. Apart cannot be apart. Not for long. And not stay in that real relationship with Christ. Because as important as it is to be connected to the head, well, guess what? The head is always where the body is, right? I mean, you don't have this out-of-body experience where the head's like way over here and the body's like way over there. No, the truth is if we're connected to the head, we're going to be interconnected with one another. And so you see in verse 25, he says, there should be no schism. That's a word that means division or a, a valley, a competition, you know, a, a rift in the body. But that the members should have the same care for one another. Sometimes in our physical body, of course, we'll have some kind of pain come in or, or do something like that. And we'll have a part that begins to only live to serve itself. You know, it doesn't contribute anything to the rest of the body. It only is self-absorbed and all that. And... Anything that comes in, it just uses to feed itself. And we know that condition as cancer, right? It's one of those things in a physical body that someone says, oh, cancer. Well, you know what? Spiritual bodies can have that in the sense that if there's a person who thinks their part is, it's all about me. Well, that can be a very cancerous Christian. And so you also see that there are body parts and different disorders that folks have. And you know what? You can have something like Parkinson's disease or you can have paralysis you can have uh, MS or other things like that. And what's happening there is that the head is sending instructions that the body is really not following. And so, again, just thinking through some of those things, that's what he's talking about here. Not schisms, not a rift, not a disconnect between the head and the body and the rest of the members. And so how can you tell that Jesus is your head? How can you know for sure? How can you be confident of this that not only theologically of course he's your head and that you've given your life to him but that practically he is your head and he's leading your life and he's uh, directing your thoughts and your action well I think it's found right there in verse 26 verse 26 this is what it says if one member suffers the rest of the members suffer with it if one member is honored all the members rejoice with it See, I think one of the greatest indicators of our connection to the head is how we treat the other body parts. I mean, that's, that's the best indicator of our real relationship with Christ because he said, if you love me, you will love each other. That's, that's what will help because, again, it's easy to love Jesus. It's easy to be loved by Jesus. But the real test comes when it says, oh, well, man, there's another, another body part who sees the life very differently than I do and, and kind of acts different than I do and has different priorities and all the rest and seems to have very different perspectives on things. And he says, you know, can't they see it? Well, I don't know. They're not the eye. Maybe they could hear it. You know, maybe they're the ear or something like that. And so you see in those things that this is a great indicator and an answer to these two simple questions, which is, first of all, when someone else in the body suffers, what's your reaction? Oh, I've got to get away from that person. I don't like suffering. don't like thinking about those things. got to get away from that. No, I, I think what it says here is that an a interconnected body, when one part suffers, the whole thing suffers. The whole body reacts. And then the second question, when somebody is blessed in the body, how do you react? Well, I feel jealous and terrible and I can't believe that God's always blessing them and they're never blessing me and that sort of thing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not an interconnected body. See, if somebody gets hurt, if somebody falls into sin, let's say, and they are hurting, it's very easy, especially if you're the nose, to look down your nose and say, well, I would never do such a thing or, you know, all the rest of that sort of thing. Be very judgmental about it or to be uh, the person who says, well, I'm going to point the finger at him. That's my job. You know, I'm pointing out sin, finding uh, there, find fault. That's what I do. You know, I am a finger in the body of Christ and I will point out all the problems that I see. No, it says to suffer with them, to suffer with them, to say, man, that hurts me as much as it hurt them. And I want to see if there's some way that maybe I could be used to restore them. See, I think about this. Uh, a few years ago, I actually hit my thumb really, really, really hard in, in the door. I closed it in the door. And it was one of those things that I, I can just tell you my whole body uh, suffered. Now, we can just put it that way. First of all, my mouth was singing the praises of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah! <laughs> hallelujah, Lord. You know, I don't think I'd let anything 
intelligible out, but I don't know what was going on in my brain. Anyway, that, that, that was it. Eyes full of tears. And, of course, as soon as I got my thumb out, the other hand opening the door, getting the thumb out and all the rest of that, what was left of it. And I go in to the fridge. You know, the feet are running to the fridge to get the ice to take care of all this. And here's the thing. I couldn't sleep for two nights. Maybe you have that where it's just like, womp, womp. <laughs> Well, wow. you know, and you're like, oh, come on, you know, just cut the whole thing off or something. And it's just this little thing, this little thumb that I don't think about, you know, I rarely think about my thumb. And yet all of a sudden my whole body couldn't think of anything else. And if, uh, if you know, body parts for our body acted the way so many Christians do, this would be it, the blame game. You know, my fingers to my thumb. We got out of the way. What's wrong with you? You know, we were there and we managed to escape. You know, my thumb would say to my hand, I wouldn't even been there if it wasn't for you, you know. But if a part of the body is hurting, this is it. We need to hurt with it. And the Bible also says we're to rejoice with the parts that rejoice. You know, if, if one part of my body is happy, the rest of my body ought to be happy with it if it can. So just thinking again about that body parts picture, you know, I, I think of things that make me happy. I've kind of mixed up uh, nutritional thoughts, but one of them is I, I have told my doctor, a happy heart is a healthy heart, and nothing makes my heart quite as happy as a Krispy Kreme. And so, uh, you know, I just tell it that. And, and here's the thing, I mean, my, my Certainly a lot of my mouth uh, and a lot of my body rejoices with the Krispy Kreme, but I can picture the arteries saying, no, 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 we don't want this. You know, this is not good. And, and what blesses one can stress another. But what it's really saying here is, you know what? When God does something great in somebody else's life, it's not a competition that, oh, man, you know, God always does it for them and he never does it for me and that sort of thing. You know, Scott's hands always getting recognition, you know, and feet still in the shoe, you know, and that kind of stuff. You go, wait a minute. Listen, the different parts, if one part is blessed, we're all blessed with it. If one part is hurting, hey, we all rush to deal with that as best we can. And so you think about these things. This is what it says in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now, I close out with some thoughts. Many of you probably feel along the way in your life, you've had some pressure either from within or without to be something that you really weren't. You know, maybe you had a brother or you had a sister who was this and they were that or why can't you be more like and all that kind of stuff, you know, and maybe you put that pressure on yourself or you think even God is doing that. Hey, why can't you be more like, you know, no. Why can't you be more like Christ? That's the only question that really has any real answer and what makes you more like christ could look very very different than what makes me more like him it'll have some commonality but it'll be played out very very different and so when god wants us to change he's wanting us to be more like jesus and anything else can lead to self-condemnation or to self-exaltation either one of those things and competition and envy. And God wants to gift you and to place you in the body of Christ in a very special way so that you could say, you know what? I am different than everybody. Exactly. That's why you have a part to play. And I close with this story. It's a parable. And it was once upon a time there was a zookeeper. And he had this little zoo going. And he decided, hey, we need to bring some education to this place. And so he opened a little school and of course had a school board. Now the school board adopted a balanced curriculum and that was running and flying and swimming, right? Those are the three uh, for an animal, not reading, writing, and arithmetic and all the rest. So you had running, swimming, and flying. And to ease the administrative burden, they just said all animals are going to take all subjects. That's the way we're going to do it. And so the duck, of course, made excellent grades when it came to swimming, but he was just okay in flying, not that great. And he had to stay after school every day, actually, in remedial running, and he had, you know, the, the little web feet there. And so soon his feet were so sore that he was only average in swimming, too. He lost a lot of his enthusiasm there. Now, the rabbit was excellent at running, although they were a little concerned about his unorthodox approach to it. He seemed to do it differently than everybody else. And he got a D in swimming and failed flying altogether and ended up <laughs> hopping mad, my friends. Now, 
the eagle that they also had there was consistently absent from running and swimming class. All he wanted to do was fly. And so he was grounded appropriately by the instructor and soon dropped out of the school altogether. Now the obvious moral of that story as you think it through with me is that everybody's somebody but nobody is everybody and a part cannot be a part. We need to actually be integrated together in the body of Christ and we need each other's gifts. That's one of the things that God has done and he distributed some of the gifts to others so that you would have to learn to love and interact and and all of that to be able to actually enjoy life fully. And so if I could do everything myself, I would. And I could, if I only had to depend on myself, I would. I would have that unholy trinity, as Pastor Pedro calls it. I, me, my. my me, myself, and I. And so that is why it ends where it starts for us. Without a head, you're dead. Without a head, you're dead. And it's a good question to consider as we close out, which is have you come personally to a place where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the head of your life. Because you're never going to find peace. You're never going to find a, a real place in this life. You're never going to find the reason you exist without him. Because all you'll be is some body part floating out somewhere. And you won't even have life in that body part. Because it's Christ who gives life. And so all you'll be is just some dead little thing floating around out there. Looking all over the place. How to fill the holes in my life. And so Jesus... When you come to him, one of the things that he gives you is just a greater understanding of how you fit into his plan. Not your plan, but his. And your plan is a very frustrating plan. I lived a lot of years with my plan. And uh, it's a pretty frustrating thing. And then there can be that peace that comes when you start living God's plan for your life. It, it tends to make a lot of very puzzling things make a lot more sense thinking about it this way you know a lot of us have been through a lot of things that mold and shape our body part to the specific thing that God has for us and you start saying well why did I go through that why did God allow that why would he do that in my life well you know what because that's the specific part that you can play in the body of Christ maybe there are others out there who will say I don't know why God would do this well let me tell you what that happened to me as well, but here's what God is doing. And here's what God has done. And that's a unique thing that you can do. See, there's th people that you can reach that I can't reach. There's people that maybe Marty could reach through what he's doing that we can't. And all the rest of that. And so you start saying, hey, every part has its part. And I think it's such a wonderful thing when you can start to say, this is why I was born. And this is why I'm alive. But the bottom line is, until you are what the Bible calls reborn, you'll never know why you were born. You'll never really understand the purpose and meaning of your life. And before you can be found, the most important thing is you have to be willing to admit you're lost. That's hard for guys, you know. We do that. I got a GPS now. I never have to admit I'm lost. I just have to follow it. But... You know, the family that let me borrow this, we didn't have one. I didn't, couldn't believe we didn't have one of these. But the family who let me borrow this, I just want to talk about that real quickly because there's, there's so much in it. You know what happened is that they found the potato. This is, <laughs> this is what they found first. They just found the potato. Okay. Oop. That's what we got. And one body part. That's all they could find. They said, well, we got this. I said, I don't think that's going to really tell the whole story. I, I, you know, I don't like that for, for Wednesday night. But here's what they did. The kids went on a mad hunt at their house and started looking under cushions and under the bed and, you know, opening drawers and all this, and they're finding parts. Mom, I found a part! You know, I found an eye, I found a leg, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the joy of finding those things. And if you saw the movie Stor uh, uh, Toy Story, of which, of course, he was one of the stars, uh, you see in that, uh, it talked in there about being a lost toy, you know, and the sorrow of being a lost toy. And I think there are very few things that are sadder than thinking about that. But the joy that is coming with finding those parts. And the Bible says that's exactly how God feels about us. To the nth degree that he says, man, there is incredible celebration in heaven. There's an incredible joy that comes when one part is found. You know, hey, I found a lost part of the body of Christ. And I just think that's a wonderful analogy and a wonderful reminder that if you're sitting here tonight and you say, 
man, I feel like I'm stuck between the couch cushion of life, you know. <laughs> I, I'm over here going, help, I can't even figure out what my life is supposed to be about. Again, it's where it started. Without a head, you're dead. But that head is looking for lost parts. And he's looking for you tonight. And if there is one thing that I know, the Bible says that he left the 99 who were safe and sound. And he said, he goes out looking for the one. So what does that mean? That means, I don't know if there's 300 or so people in here. There might be three or so people in here that God is really, really looking for you. I don't know how many it might be. It's not always the percentage. But the point is, that's the one he cares about the most at that moment. That's the part. And if you're a part of the body of Christ, that also has to be the heart. That we say, you know what? That lost one right now matters most. So what we're going to do is close out with an opportunity. If there's anyone here who doesn't know that they know that they have a relationship with Christ, that they're plugged into the head, and that they have the life, the eternal life that he's offered, and we're just going to close our eyes, we're going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to acknowledge your need for him tonight by raising your hand and accepting Christ into your life as your Lord, as your Savior. And what I'd invite you to do, if you're a believer here tonight, there's really only two categories of people here tonight. There's lost and there's found. There's believer and there's unbeliever. And if you're a believer here tonight, hey, this is your opportunity to pray for those who are not. To pray for those who right now are saying, I'm not found, I'm lost. I want to be found. Hey, here I am, Lord. Pick me. Well, that's what your opportunity is here tonight. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time that we've had here today. And I thank you for this acknowledgement and this reality, Lord, that we can realize that even we who know you and never question whether you love us, sometimes, Lord, we can just struggle with finding our fit. Lord, sometimes we can just feel like we're stuck under a couch somewhere and don't know exactly what's going on. But Lord, I pray that with these things that were shared tonight that they would be taken home in the heart of each person here and lord that we as the body of christ here locally would be reaching out to people looking for the lost with the same fervor that you do and lord seeking also just to use whatever gifts you give for your glory and your purpose and we pray this in jesus name amen